I'm Slava Tsilba. Welcome to Conversations with Slava. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Dean Baker. You co-founded the Center for Economic and Policy Research in 1999. Your areas of research include housing and macroeconomics, intellectual property, social security, Medicare and European labor markets. You are the author of several books, including RICT, How Globalization and the Rules of the Modern Economy were Structured to Make the Rich Richer. Your blog, Beat the Press, provides commentary on economic reporting. You received your BA from Swarthmore College and your PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. Dr. Baker, if your PhD were plagiarized, you would be outraged, the academic community would be outraged. How is that different from violations of intellectual property rights, for example, in the case of vaccines? Well, very, very different issues. Um, if someone were to plagiarize my dissertation, they would be claiming that they had done work that I had done and they hadn't done. They'd be lying. It'd be a fraud. Whereas if they were to make a copy of my dissertation and spread it around, you know, without paying me money for it, that's fine. And the whole issue here of intellectual property is you have, have in effect a public good that we're trying to privatize. We have knowledge. So in the case of you know, writing a song, it's already been created. So the issue of a copyright there is preventing someone from making copies of it. You know, I could still, if I, have, uh, I wrote a song, I could play it as much as I want. And anyone else could play it as much as I want, they want without copyright protection case of patents is the same story you know so we're talking about the vaccine um we're not if we got rid of patent rights on, on the vaccines for the coronavirus people in the united states could still get just as many vaccines what that would mean is that you'd have other countries india brazil other countries that might have that technology that they also would be able to produce the vaccine so the point here it's a non-exclusive good that others could enjoy without diminishing our ability my ability to enjoy it so to my view um, that's a great thing. And again, I, I take a strong stand on plagiarism. That's a very, very different issue. Um, that's, a, that's a version of fraud. But don't uh, intellectual property rights make sure there is no effectively bootlegging that uh, it is actually produced the way it is produced? Uh, how do we know uh, the version produced in India or South Africa or Venezuela or wherever is actually authentic and is working the way the original version is supposed to work? Yeah, it's a really good question. There's something that's often confused in discussions of these issues uh, where they, there's a distinction between a counterfeit on a, and an unauthorized copy. So let's say someone produced the drug and they said it's Pfizer's vaccine you know, so it was produced by Pfizer and it wasn't. Okay, that, that's counterfeit. So they're saying, you know, Pfizer made it and in fact, Pfizer didn't make it. So if you thought Pfizer made it, you know, you might believe that Pfizer has quality control. I think they probably do, you know, so that would be telling you that this is a, a safe vaccine. It is what you're expecting. On the other hand, if some producer in a third country, India, Brazil, whoever it might be, that they produced it and they put their own name on it. They didn't put Pfizer's name on it. They put their own name on it. Well, then you're relying on their credibility and maybe it's as good, maybe it isn't. But, you know, it, 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 we have ways to monitor that. And again, with the case of drugs, that's an unusual case because generally, uh, I can't speak for everywhere, but in most countries, it's illegal to sell a drug without the, the government's approval. So the United States has the Food and Drug Administration. Most other countries have something comparable and it's generally illegal to sell that drug without the, the, the government's approval. So again, this is, this is quite apart from patents. So this is saying, you know, if I'm producing a drug in India and I'm claiming it's this specific drug, well, the government certifies that it has nothing to do with patent. It has to be that, you know, again, people might do it. I mean, we know people make black market drugs, it's done. But, you know, that, is, that has nothing to do with patents. That's simply a matter of saying, okay, this is what it is. And if you don't do that, then that's fraud. And obviously it's potentially very harmful in the case of drugs. 
And, you know, of course, people can and should be prosecuted for that. But that's a different issue from patent protection. In a recent monk debate with Thomas Bekweni, Director General of the International Pharma Trade Association, you said, quote, you have very little incentive to develop the technical expertise to produce the Pfizer vaccine if you are going to get arrested for doing so. Could you please explain how intellectual property rights are enforced? What would likely happen if a country or a company disregarded these rights? For example, India or South Africa defied the World Trade Organizations. Yes, so we've had a kind of game of whack-a-mole with uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry over vaccines. So what they've been saying is, well, our patents really don't matter. Of course, there's a, the, the context for this. There's a resolution before the WTO put up by uh, South Africa and India calling for patents to be suspended for the duration of the pandemic on vaccines and also treatments and tests. And the pharmaceutical industry is very strongly opposed to that predictably. And they're saying, well, that really wouldn't matter anyhow. And part of that argument is that they don't have, other countries don't have the technical expertise to produce these vaccines. There are complex manufacturing processes, which of course is in part true. I mean, the Pfizer vaccine is a complex manufacturing process. It's a mRNA vaccine, a relatively new technology. Um, same with Moderna, all, all of them are somewhat complex. So you couldn't just, you know, we couldn't just go into our garage and uh, start, start making the vaccine. Um, the point I and others have made about uh, India and, and South Africa and several other uh, developing countries, they do actually have expertise. That doesn't mean they could produce the, the vaccine tomorrow. What we, we would like is for Pfizer to actually share that expertise as well. They could be paid for it, but you know, do webinars, do consultations, share the expertise so that you could get factories up and running as quickly as possible, as many places as possible. But the other point, you know, to say they don't have the expertise, well, a generic company in India, you know, which are, India, of course, is far and away the world's biggest manufacturer of drugs. So they, they do have plenty of expertise. Um, a generic company in India would have no incentive to try and reverse engineer. How could they, no one, no one would have incentive right now to sit down and figure out, okay, how could we produce the Pfizer vaccine? Because if they were actually to design a factory to produce it, well, Pfizer would go ahead and prosecute them for violating their patent and the, the Indian government at least would be expected to. I mean, that could end up being a very serious issue in trade because maybe the Indian government wouldn't do that. But we would certainly, we meaning the United States government, would certainly be pressuring them to do that. So, you know, a, a, at least an established drug company, and you don't imagine someone doing it in their backyard, so an established drug company probably doesn't want to get itself in that legal morass. So they're not about to devote a lot of resources to figuring out how they could produce the Pfizer vaccine when they, they don't have a legal right to do it. One argument against that resolution by India and South Africa was uh, innovation and competition. How does it relate? It seems paradoxical considering we are talking about patent monopolies. Yeah, the argument that the industry makes is that they need incentive for innovation. So the argument is that they have to, they're not going to devote their resources to develop new drugs or vaccines, whatever it might be, if they can't sell it as a monopoly. Because if they could, if everyone, if everyone's producing the drug, so Pfizer develops a new drug, a new vaccine, and there's other producers that are selling it and they haven't paid for the research, then it's going to be very difficult for Pfizer, whoever happens to be the innovator, to, to recover their research costs. That's a true argument, but there's two points to be made here. First off, in, in the case of the vaccines, they've almost certainly more than covered their research costs many times over. If we take Pfizer, they had a advanced purchase agreement with the US government where we agreed to buy up 100 million doses right off the bat at, at, at $2 each, $2 billion, which easily covered their research costs because they, they were only they were only researching for eight months or the, in fact, less than eight months. We know that because the, 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 the virus didn't exist before February, at least not as a worldwide pandemic. And they had a, had a vaccine approved by our Food and Drug Administration in, in November, and it was even earlier in the UK. And there were also advanced purchase agreements in the UK and in Europe, other places. So they had very, very little risk there. Now, in the case of Moderna, 
they actually, we actually paid for the research up front. So they again developed a vaccine. They were at the forefront right alongside Pfizer. And we had actually paid, we mean the US government, we paid 500 million or about $450 million for the initial research in the phase one, two trials, which almost certainly would have covered their costs by any normal calculation. And then we threw out another 450 million to pay for their phase three trials. So we literally paid the whole bill. So, you know, they, they, they don't have a story to say, oh, well, we have no incentive. But the other point that I'd love to see people take away from this is the, the Moderna example is a great one to me because we had the government actually pay for the research and testing of, uh, of the vaccine. So in the United States, we already spend somewhere around 45 billion a year, uh, we meaning the federal government, through the National Institutes of Health and several other health agencies on mostly basic research. Sometimes it's more, it, it's more final research. We have had drugs developed and tested um, on the government's time, but most of it is more basic research. And in the case of Moderna, we actually paid for the development of the vaccine. It was a success. So to my view, that's, that's a great story, but we should leave the patent out of the picture because it's a little bizarre to me that on the one hand, here it is, the U.S. taxpayers paying for the research, paying for the testing of the drug, and then we tell Moderna, oh, go get a patent on it and then charge whatever you feel like. Um, you know, it's pay for it once, don't pay for it twice. And I think the model of paying for research in advance is a great one. Because in addition to making the, the final product available as a generic, or at least it should be available as a cheap generic, on top of that, you, require, you could require that the research be open source so that everyone could benefit from it. So if we had done that with Moderna, what we could have said was, okay, everything along the way is open sourced, which means everyone could benefit from, from your knowledge, from what you get from it, from your clinical test. We'd know all the clinical test results. And then on top of that, you know, the manufacturing process, that also would be open source so that we wouldn't be in a situation where only Moderna is able to manufacture it. We'd have other companies around the world with the expertise. So I think that's a great model. Unfortunately, we only pursued half of it. We gave them the money, but we also gave them the patent rights. And when there is the article by Lee Fan in The Intercept, drug makers promise investors we will soon hike COVID vaccine prices, March 18th, 2021. There is a quote from Moderna President Stefan Hodge. Quote, post pandemic, as we get into those, what I will call seasonal epidemics, what you would expect to happen with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we would expect more normal pricing based on value. It, it, this is a remarkable story, not altogether surprising, but nonetheless remarkable. Um, they had, from their vantage point, concessionary prices. You know, so when I was mentioning the advanced purchase agreements, um, they view that as concession. Now, obviously, they're making plenty of money on, on the advanced purchase agreements. They're char charging uh, $2 a vaccine. I'm sorry, $20. I think I said two earlier, $20 a vaccine. I'm sure uh, the actual cost of manufacturing the vaccine and, and distributing it's probably two or three, four dollars at most. So they were doing very well at you know the prices in the advanced purchase agreements and, and same with Moderna. Um, but the idea is that, okay, that was during the pandemic. Let's say, you know, next three, four, five months, we get the pandemic under control in the U.S. and at least the other wealthy countries might be much longer, of course, in the developing world. But at least in the wealthy countries who get it under control, what they're expecting now is that there'll be variants of the virus. Um, and, and also, of course, we don't know how long the, the protection, even if there weren't variants, we don't know how long the protection from the vaccine will last. So the point is that come next fall or maybe next winter, we're all going to need shots again. And then they expect, or at least the, the, this is what their, their CEO is saying, they expect to be able to charge much higher prices. So this is going to be, you know, kind of the, the cow that keeps giving milk, that they're they're just going to get money year after year after year because, you know, there'll be variants or people will need a booster every year, similar to what we have with flu shots. So most people get a flu shot every year. So their, their vision, I assume, is something like that, but they'll be charging much higher prices. And to wait after being paid by the government in advance. Handsome. Yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is a very good deal. So 
they get, uh, you know, in, in, in the case of Pfizer, you know, it was a very lo low risk proposition because, you know, suppose the vaccine, it turned out not to be very good. There were others that were better. Um, we still would have been obligated to pay them uh, $2 billion for 100 million uh, doses. So, and, and again, a short time frame. So typically, if you listen to the pharmaceutical industry, they'll say, oh, it could take us 15, 20 years to develop a drug from early stage preclinical testing to getting it through the uh, final approval process. And that's to some extent true. I mean, they, they exaggerate, but there is a lot of time involved. In this case, we know <laughs> there was eight months, you know, they started the, the, the process in March and uh, they have a, a, a approved vaccine in November. So we know it was eight months. It wasn't this long period. So they weren't taking a big risk. And again, in the case of Moderna, literally no risk because, uh, you know, supposed at the end of it, the Food and Drug Administration, the other regulatory agencies uh, didn't pass muster. Well, they got paid, you know, so, so they literally had no risk. But now they're going to say, oh, OK, well, year after year after year, we're going to be selling these vaccines and charging considerably higher prices than they do already. So they're going to get a lot out of this, at least in their their vision. Not enforcing the intellectual property rights on these vaccines. How would it affect the bottom lines of these corporations? Well, if, if we didn't enforce their, their patent rights, they obviously would get less money than they had hoped. You know, and again, I, you know, looking at Pfizer, looking at Moderna, if we, we just snapped our fingers and said, OK, from this point forward, anyone who wants to produce them could produce them, it'd still come out way ahead. I mean, there's, again, you do any sort of calculation with their research costs, however, which they've already made selling the vaccines, there, there's no way they're not coming out considerably ahead. Now, they won't come out as much ahead as if we did honor their patents. So it's not as though they would have a lot to cry about if they no longer had their patent rights honored as of you know, March 18th, uh, 2021. They'd have still made plenty of money, obviously just less than what they had expected to make or what they had hoped to make, maybe is a better term. Um, so they, 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 they would not have a lot to complain about though. I would like to address the testing and the vaccine rollout. In your article, Dealing with a pandemic as if human lives mattered, February 2nd, 2021. You say, quote, it's hard to look at the track record over the last year and not conclude that governments failed badly in their efforts to control the pandemic. This is partly due to corruption and a failure of imagination, as in the decision not to open source the development of vaccines, treatments, and tests. How do you justify the very serious charge of corruption? Well, corruption, I would say, in the sense of trying to ensure the profits of the pharmaceutical industry over um, human lives. So what strikes me, what we should have wanted was open sourcing all the technology so that we could have produced the vaccines as quickly as possible. Um, we should have had stockpiles of, of, of the vaccines, hundreds of millions, if not billions, of all the ones that went to phase three testing. So phase three testing is of course the final phase. That's when you give the vaccine to tens of thousands of people, a control group and a placebo group. And it in invariably takes a, a substantial period of time, three, four months, because you need enough people in the, the control group to actually get the get the the, the pandemic. So you have a you have a test, you know, so you have a, a valid test. So you you have this three or four month period where you're waiting to see what the results are. And what would have made sense is to, during that period, have everyone in the world who has the technology, I mean, has the ability, you give them the technology, um, has the ability to produce these vaccines, develop large stockpiles, you know, as I say, four or 500 million of each of them, maybe over a billion or at least a capacity to, to, to produce more quickly, maybe you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions a month. Because again, we want just not just the United States and Europe and other wealthy countries, we want the developing world to get this, both as humanitarian, but also as, uh, as you know, for our own good. Because if it ends up being the case that in Sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia, wherever it might be, that you develop a new strain of the virus, viruses mutate as we know, um, that's vaccine resistant, possibly more deadly, we're, we're back at ground zero. You know, again, maybe we could develop a new vaccine, but everyone who's been inoculated, suddenly they have to go out and get it again. We have to produce more. So we should have stockpiled large numbers of the vaccines. And what someone could rightly say is, well, we didn't know they were effective. You know, before the phase three tests, we didn't know. That's right. But the cost of producing 
say half a million, make it a billion of vaccines and having them have to throw them out because it turns out they're not effective or maybe they're not safe. There's side effects or there, there could be, we didn't know that. Um, that cost is trivial compared to the, the health risks, the number of lives that are lost. And for that matter, the straight out economic cost that you know the US, Europe, other countries, they're largely shut down because they have to slow the spread of the pandemic. So the fact that we didn't place an absolute priority on producing as many vaccines as possible as soon as they went into the phase three testing, maybe even earlier. I mean, arguably you could say the results from phase one, two testing were good enough. I mean, I, you know, that's not my judgment, but someone else might make that judgment and say, yeah, these, there's a good reason to think they're gonna be successful, let's start now. But certainly by the point where they're in phase three testing, that should have been a point at which we started massively producing all these vaccines. And again, just sharing the technology as widely as possible. So if you had a factory in India and in Brazil, wherever it might be that could be retooled, we should have had them doing that. And it was a real, it, it was a, a failure with enormous consequences that we didn't do that. And how do you make sure that politicians who apparently are primarily interested in securing these pharma profits who are heavily lobbied by the pharma industry, engage with your ideas and um, support you? Well, it's, you know, it is very hard to move political opinion here for two reasons. I mean, one, the obvious one, the pharmaceutical industry is tremendously powerful and, you know, they fight like crazy. I mean, we're seeing this with uh, their efforts to block the Indian South African initiative at the World Trade Organization. They're fighting that very, very hard and, you know, really coming up with a lot of disingenuous arguments. You referred to my debate earlier with Thomas Cooney, the, the director general of the International Pharmaceutical Association, he said, oh, uh, patents aren't a problem. It's not the vaccines. The reason we can't distribute more is we don't have enough vials and syringes. Um, I, I mean, I can't answer that one, but that would be a little mind boggling to me. I mean, uh, you know, I, I assume these people aren't morons. You know, if, uh, you know, why we weren't producing billions of vials and syringes to make sure that we could distribute vaccines when we had that, that really is kind of mind boggling. So I can't say for hundred percent certainty that he's not telling the truth, but all I could say is if he is telling the truth, we really have some very big problems. Um, but the other part of the story is that there's a real problem among intellectuals, even many progressive intellectuals, they literally can't think beyond patents as a mechanism for producing, for, for motivating innovation. And I, I don't know how many times I've had these arguments with people where they say, well, if we didn't have patent monopolies, what would be the incentive? And I've had people, economists, you know, not just someone I grabbed randomly, I've had economists where I'd almost have to be yelling at them, they would do it for money. And, you know, the idea that people work for money shouldn't be a strange idea, economists, because most people, of course, do work for money. So the idea that we would pay drug companies up front, we would pay for their research. We did that with Moderna. We would pay for their research. And, you know, again, they'd have contracts. If a company uh, didn't produce anything, they wouldn't get their contracts renewed. They wouldn't. I, I point to the U.S. military industry. I'm not a big fan of the U.S. military industry, but if you want to point to someone who does work on contracts, we have companies, Lockheed, Boeing, they make billions of dollars working on contracts, designing weapon systems, designing fighter bombers. They make money on that. They might get patents too, but they're getting money basically based on their government contracts. So the idea that you would have drug companies that make money based on government contracts rather than patent monopolies, you have a lot of intellectual types that just find it very, very hard to understand. I don't understand why they find it hard to understand, but they do. And that makes it harder to move the debate because you have people that, as I say, for whatever reason, um, they can't seem to think beyond the current system. You mentioned arguments with other economists. When I, as a non-economist, uh, non-politician, hear, for example, Leather Summers argue against a bigger stimulus relief, I hear somebody simply defending his class, somebody wanting not wealthy people to be vulnerable and uh, to accept whatever Amazon or Walmart or other corporations tell them to do because we cannot afford to say no. Um, to what extent is this really about class interests, class warfare, 
masquerading as economics? Well, I think there is, that is a very big problem. I, I've had many you know, debates, arguments with Larry Summers over the years. Uh, uh, I'll say he does have, a, he's not obviously wrong. I mean, I, I disagreed with him on, 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 on the stimulus question. I'll just say he's not obviously wrong. But I'll tell you, I think most of the arguments, most of the time when I've encountered people say, are making arguments uh, supporting the pharmaceutical industry, I think they mostly believe that. I think the issue isn't so much that they're designing their arguments for the industry, although you do see that. I mean, I have seen our, people make arguments that I, I just don't think they could actually believe themselves. I think it's more that if you make an argument that the industry likes, you're more likely to get it heard. So the industry does things like they endow chairs. Um, I, I shouldn't say the pharmaceutical, and the pharmaceutical industry probably does. I don't know that for certain, but you do have, have major, you know, funders that have very clear interest at stake and they'll die university chairs or, or we have any number of uh, think tanks, you know, the American Enterprise Institute, there's other, others that are American Enterprise Institute in the scheme of things is probably a more credible one, but you have others that are less credible that basically they'll support right-wing work that supports corporate interest. So I think that's, that's more commonly the case, but again, I, I can't really speak for, you know, what people's motivations are. I'll just say as a factual matter, there's a lot more money for people making arguments that support corporate interest rather than those arguing on the other side where there's very little money. So, you know, again, whatever people may think, I can't say for certain, but I could just say that the arguments, you know, for, for the right, for corporate interest, those are much more likely to get money than those on the left. You have also written about ways to support non-corporate media, independent media. You spoke about vouchers, and one of the points was copyright. How would that system you are proposing affect corporate media, particularly bigger corporations, and where patents? Yeah, well, we have a situation in the United States where we're seeing, you know, literally just a collapse of our traditional media, the newspapers, uh, magazines, uh, less so with television, but they're feeling this too. And, and, and an awful lot of that, well, two things. One is just the internet so that you have material being distributed on the internet and it's very hard for them to make money on that. So every newspaper has a website, but they tend to make much less from their website than they did from their traditional advertising in, in their print form. The other is just the, the power of Google and, um, and, and Facebook that they could, uh, people want to advertise because um, they could have very directed ads in Google and Facebook. Whereas if you take out an ad in a newspaper, whether it's online or the print version, you're hitting a lot of people that have no interest whatsoever in your product. So they've lost a huge amount of ad revenue and that is how for the most part they're supported. So as a result of that, you've seen massive layoffs, a number of many, many uh, newspapers across the country, even some fairly large ones have gone bankrupt. Those that happen to have almost invariably laid off a large share of their, their staff, their uh, journalistic staff. So the question is, can you develop an alternative mechanism? And that's where my idea for voucher tax credit, whatever you want to call it, comes in. So the logic here is that you would have individuals have a certain amount of money, say $100. I mean, that's arbitrary. It could be more, it could be less, but let's just start with $100. And they could give that either to an individual. So I know, and I, I have it beyond journalism. So it'd be writer. I say creative work more generally because it's a problem for creative workers. It's not just journal, journalists. It's also musicians. So uh, copyright for music. That's, you know, again, the amount of money for recorded music has just collapsed. So I could give 100, my $100 to, you know, person whose writing I like, a person whose music I like, whatever it might be. The condition of them getting the money is that they don't get copyright protection. So this, again, gets to the idea that we, that copyright or patents, that these are subsidies. These are the way the government pays for things. And the logic of this is, okay, we're going to pay you once. We won't pay you twice. So we'll pay you for, you know, upfront, you could be in the system. 
and you'll get you know the the credits from whoever thinks your stuff's worthwhile and there could be intermediaries which i imagine most of would go to intermediaries um so whoever thinks your work is worthwhile and then your intermediary could be a newspaper you know but then you don't also get copyright protection so anyone who wants to could just copy it and send it all over the world which i think for most writers most artists they would consider that a good thing uh, someone once threatened me saying well what's wrong with me making copies of your book and selling them i go nothing you want to do that i mean go ahead um, you know, so, so anyhow, you get, you get the money once, not twice, but the point here is you could support a huge amount of journalism with this. So again, there's no guarantee. So people say, well, I want to write about X, Y, and Z. Well, maybe no one cares about X, Y, and Z. So that's unfortunate. You want to do that. No one wants to support you. But, you know, my expectation would be is that most journalism, most types of journalism that at least significant, significant number of people value that would be supported. And this is, you know, a totally alternative mechanism. Now, I wouldn't get rid, I wouldn't, you know, arrest someone for staying in the current system. So I, what I envision is as a competitor. So if you have the traditional newspapers and they say, hey, we don't want any part of this, we're going to stick with our model, they're welcome to do so. The only downside for them is that you're going to have a lot of very good reporters opting for this new system, this, this voucher tax credit system, and their work is going to be available for free. So if I want to go into the Los Angeles Times, um, you know, I have to pay them whatever amount of money to get on their website. Well, if on the other hand, there's a Los Angeles News or whatever they I call themselves and they're in this alternative system, anyone who wants to could just go on their site any day of the week. So if the Los Angeles Times wants to continue with its current model, it's welcome to do so. And maybe they will. Maybe they'd be able to survive. But in any case, the point is you'd have an alternative which is likely to support a very large number of journalists. I should also add, because other people have jumped on this, that, oh, why don't we just give them money in newspapers? Well, that's both, of uh, you know, I think a philosophical and a practical problem. At a philosophical level, why, you know, here's the Los Angeles Times to say, hey, we want to be in on this system. We'll change our model. Um, give us money. Um, not individuals have the government given. Well, why, what gives them priority? So I want to set up a system and I haven't had a newspaper um, but I want to set one up so I don't get it, but the Los Angeles Times gets it. Maybe my 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 reporters will be better than theirs, but I'm not eligible. It, it's hard to argue that as a as a philosophical matter. What's the what's the priority here? Why should they get priority? The other point is as a political matter, um, we have this big issue in in uh, the United States that you know the a lot of people, primarily on the right. Um, fake news, you know, that uh, why would I give money to, to the Los Angeles Times? They're fake news. You know, I, I mean, 90 percent of what they say at the Times, the critics say is nonsense, but whatever. You know, they believe that and a lot of people believe that. So if you just say, no, well, you don't have to give the money to LA Times. Here's a hundred bucks. Give it to whoever you like. And some of that will go to horrible things. I mean, we have a lot of racist people in the country. They'll give it to racist publications. They'll give it to ones that distribute nonsense conspiracy theories. I don't think we could prevent that. But the point is we could have that money used for supporting good journalism, which I think has to be the first priority. But it would also at some point threaten the current model that is worth billions of dollars to Comcast and company. I would expect it very much disrupt the current system, you know, and, you know, again, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy in the sense that if someone says, oh, we can't compete, you go, well, you know, join it. You know, it's, we don't, we don't, copyright is, copyright and patents both, they're, they're public policies, you know, and they're quite explicitly, it's, it's kind of funny because I often have arguments with people and they go, oh, they're in the constitution. I said, go read the constitution. Um, they're quite explicitly public policies to promote the arts and sciences. And if they aren't doing a good job, if we don't think the current patent system is doing that in a good way, if we don't think the current copyright system is a good way, well, we aren't obligated to keep them in their current form. So if we say, okay, you know, this isn't working, we don't have good, we don't have reporters in major cities in a Cleveland and a Pittsburgh, we don't have reporters that are covering what their city council is doing, what their mayors and other local officials are doing, that's a real problem. So copyright isn't accomplishing what we set it out to do which means we should be looking to alternatives. And if those alternatives mean that the, the companies that have thrived on the copyright system aren't doing very well, uh, that's too bad. I mean, that's all I could say. I mean, we, we, we don't have an obligation to make sure that the Los Angeles Times makes money in its current form. We don't have an obligation to do that. And I understand they'll be unhappy and they'll fight it. I get that, I get the politics, but in terms of, you know, is there, you know, some moral ethical obligation to make sure the LA Times could make money in its current form? No. 
it appears you work on uh, the, uh, intellectual property rights when it comes to vaccine and your views on the media um, and this uh, tax credit voucher system are um, somewhat related, have uh, a clear connection. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, one of the things, you know, this has really been true for me as long as I've been in economics that I think it's important to think of how you structure the market. So a lot of people tend to think of the market as just given to us by, by nature. And, you know, I don't know how many times I've encountered people say, oh, our big problem is the market. And my response is no, the, the problem is how we structured the market, which doesn't mean we allow the market to do everything. But the point is, you know, the market to my view could be structured pretty much an infinite number of ways. It's infinitely malleable. So the question is, you know, how do, where do we have structures in the market that lead to outcomes we clearly don't like. I mean, in some ways we might like it. Well, I do like a lot of the outcomes of the market. You know, I can go guess sweater I like, you know, well, that's a great thing. I can go to the store and, you know, no one's gonna tell me what sweater I should get. I'll get the one that I think I like, looks good on me. You know, maybe I have bad, bad taste, that could be, but you know, in any case, that's my taste. You know, no one else is gonna tell me. Um, so that's the case the market does real well. It doesn't do well in producing prescription drugs. It doesn't do well in supporting a viable media and that's a case where we then have to look and say, okay, can we structure the market differently? And, you know, again, the intellectual property, uh, this is something, again, it just amazes me how little attention this gets, not just as like, oh, we want people to have good health or, you know, we need the media, but literally the amount of money involved. I mean, I did some calculations a couple of years ago and we could plausibly say that we redistribute over a trillion dollars a year. That's about 5% of the U.S. economy, about half of all corporate profits before tax corporate profits uh, to the holders of intellectual property rights from everyone else. It's a huge, huge amount of money. And it's, it's just not given a lot. It doesn't get anywhere near the attention it deserves. I'll just put it that way. So it's a huge issue. And um, yeah, I've spent time on it. I wish, uh, wish I could have spent more time on it. And I really do think uh, people need to, to look at intellectual property issues more closely. Final question regarding market forces. Rand Paul, for example, made the argument that uh, products and treatments become more affordable due to competition with the prices decrease. What do you make of it? Well, in general, that's true. Um, it's not going to always be true because we often have situations where we're preventing competition. But as a general rule, competition does lead to lower prices. So I wouldn't disagree with him on that. Now, what he often says is, you know, he sees competition where it doesn't exist. So, you know, you have many areas that, that, that Facebook, for example, it doesn't have a lot of competition, uh, not a, as such. I mean, we could change the rules there too. I won't go into that, but uh, Facebook has, I, I wouldn't say a monopoly, but it, it certainly, uh, it, it's not what we envision as perfect competition. But I'm, I'm a big fan of competition. Again, uh, I, I might differ with Rand Paul on how he sees that in different areas. Uh, I think I'm not positive if he's embraced this, but I know many on the right have said, we don't want the Food and Drug Administration deciding which drugs are safe. And, you know, that would, we'd have lower prices and we probably would, but on the other hand, we'd probably have a lot of drugs that are unsafe. So, so I mean, you have to think about that carefully. And, you know, in the case of uh, prescription drugs, what I would say is, well, I'm very happy to have the government there to say this is safe because I and most other people lack the expertise. And if someone just says, oh, this is safe, I mean, we could find out after the fact, sure, we all get sick, some people die, and then we'll realize, oh, they sold us bad drugs, but people were sick and people died. So, you know, finding that out after the fact doesn't do us a lot of good. And I'll get back to my sweater. I buy my sweater and it turns out, well, it's bad fabric. It, you know, it, I wash it twice and, it, you know, that's unfortunate, but the consequences of that aren't the same as if I, I get a drug that turns out not to be effective and possibly be harmful. So again, I might differ with Rand Paul on how he interprets his idea of competition, but the basic principle that competition is generally good for lowering prices, that's 100% right. So you know, at that point, at least I'd agree with him. Thank you very much for this interview, Dr. Baker. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I, I enjoyed the discussion.